Welcome, viewers, in today's program. Uh, it's indeed a pleasure to be back again uh, to discuss a very important issue. Migration and level diplomacy, which is a new subject for sure, and I have a galaxy of uh, speakers who certainly need no introduction. And since we are running out of the time, so I will, without much ado, I will invite Dr. Meena Podil, uh, Migration and Analyst, to kindly give her presentation. Meena, over yeah. to you. Yeah, Welcome. thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Dr. Agrawal and the uh, NICE team for inviting me. Um, yeah, in the interest of time, um, I will try to highlight some of the uh, contemporary issues that we have been working on then, and uh, the contemporary issue actually are bothering us uh, when you talk about labor migration, migration diplomacy, or labor diplomacy. Uh, diplomacy is quite tricky word here because um, um, when we talk about migration, migration is always uh, looked at from economic perspective and um, lack of research or lack of interest or lack of uh, I don't know what. Uh, being in this issue for the last 30 years, what I found is that uh, um, we are talking migration in very much isolation and we are talking migration from very much economic point of view. That's why uh, this is very important even that we need to unpack some of the uh, hidden issues and some of the issues that we really need to bring them on the ground. I don't want to go back to history of migration because we all know that when migration started, what type of migration we have been uh, facing and we have been enjoying, we have been managing. Uh, no need uh, historical explanation here, but um, I, would, I, I would like to link with this migration with the political process and also the, the, the social inclusion exclusion issue in this country. Uh, when we talk about labor uh, diplomacy and migration diplomacy that um, always, because uh, last two days I have been uh, listening all these um, uh, talks, speeches and uh, intellectual conversation in this forum that uh, we talk a lot about uh, foreign policy, we talk a lot lot about um, uh, ideas and the views of diplomatic missions and the diplomats, uh, for, uh, former diplomats, current diplomats, and uh, the, the, the foreign affairs officials. But in, 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 in Nepali context, uh, we don't have migration policy. That's why I, I, I want to link with this issue. With the, we, when we talk about foreign policy, we really need to bring that migration policy into it or vice versa, when we talk about migration policy, we need to bring foreign policy perspective as well. But here in Nepal, uh, we are running country through remittances economy, and we are running country through migration resources, migration knowledge, migration money, migration skill and everything, but we don't have migration policy. Here we are talking about migration diplomacy, how, 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 how we define migration diplomacy, how we define our, um, role of our uh, diplomatic missions and uh, when we are heading to i think these are some of the questions that always uh, um, i struggle with to 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 unpack um basically the, the also the migration this afternoon some somebody was talking about um, um, indo nepal relationship and the indo china relationship issue then migration issue came into it uh, briefly when we talk about um, uh, Nepali migrant uh, traveling to India and Nepali labor force working in India, even they are not a recognized official migrant, they are, um, they are, they are seen as kind of uh, cheap labor, crossing the border, uh, bringing money and supporting their family, they are not seen as official migrant, they are seen as informal migrant, informal channel. So, here and also there from gender perspective, which is uh, uh, the, the the migrant working in India is seen as a is kind of historical relationship, cultural perspective. I would say that migration from a migrant from Nepal to India are seen as a cultural uh, perspective, cultural um, uh, creature like a roti beti kind of very contentious, very uh, debatable, very controversial phrase, which feminists are not agree with that. And um, I myself, I don't agree with that perspective that the eroti beti is very much sexualized, very much uh, feminine kind of perspective. 
that is seen as kind of informal migration and the, the remittances coming from India is not counted. Migrant traveling to India or uh, Indian migrant coming to Nepal, they are not counted as a migrant, but they are the one actually contributing large amount of uh, finances to, to sustain our economy. And uh, another migration we have, which is very much looking at uh, uh, economic perspective, which is uh, beyond India, third country or Middle East or other country, and here within that other countries also beyond India migration also there are two types of um, discourses I found when I was doing research on this issue. One is that uh, the, the migration to Europe and America, we, now they are called as NRNAs. They are uh, also the, the, the from class perspective, who are the people traveling to this country, the northern uh, northern part of the world, and uh, who are the people traveling to South-South migration, I would say that the Nepali migrant to Middle East, Malaysia, Japan, uh, Korea, uh, Israel, all these countries, those are basically the backbone of the, the economy of this country. So here, the reason I'm bringing this issue here, we have all sorts of uh, various forms of migration and um, um, various destinations and um, uh, class issue and ethnic uh, and uh, social inclusion perspective. If you see the who are the people traveling to India, who are the people traveling to uh, beyond India but not Europe, and who are the people traveling to Europe who can afford to travel to Europe, and why these people are traveling? I think these are some of the questions we need to discuss in detail. I don't think we have time to discuss this issue in detail now, but these are something that I want to. Uh, bring out to the um, uh, forum for uh, for the discussion, and then uh, and then then another issue I want to raise here is the role of the embassies. Uh, this afternoon we're talking. Uh, we listen to our ambassadors, ex ambassadors, and current ambassadors and diplomatic missions representative. I mean, to be honest, it was so uh, frustrating not to not to get any perspective. Uh, on migration. They were talking about tourism, they were talking about uh, cultural heritage, they were talking about um, various other things, businesses, but they never talked about migration. And the, particularly the, our ambassador to Middle East, they, I mean, what is their job? And the, uh, for example, last year, um, uh, the COVID, the repatriation flights and uh, all these COVID responses uh, to migrant, what happened, we have that example with us. So here the big question is that what is the role of diplomatic missions when we talk about the diplomacy, what, what, what we are expecting from them and what is the terms of reference and the, what, what are they doing there and the, what is their role being a representative of the nation from where um, hundreds of thousands of migrants are traveling and they're bringing money to, to actually, uh, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I use the very negative phrase that these are the embassies and ambassador actually enjoying their uh, uh, benefits and everything from the remittances, but are they talking about uh, migrants protection issue? Are they talking about the migrants' right? So, that is why the, the not having migration policy is a big uh, uh, challenge here. We have been, uh, I know ILO and the other agencies, they have been working very hard to help ministry, uh, Nepal government to bring migration policy, but uh, this is not an issue for a political representative. This is not an issue for uh, bureaucrats. This is not an issue for our diplomats. And this is not an issue for our uh, civil society and media as well, um, unfortunately. So I think this is something that we need to focus on and advocate and um, do more research and uh, bring evidences, not having migration policy, what is happening and uh, what is happening. Various researches that I know that uh, uh, G1G and other people, they have been doing that research that uh, not having migration policy is affecting migrant adversely, very negative way, particularly the migrant from the, uh, from the migrant who are traveling to Middle East. And then this whole uh, 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 dichotomy of formal and the informal migrant, I think this is something also we need to unpack carefully, critically, and uh, come out some, some, some recommendation. I know the recommendations are actually 
not being implemented properly, but still we, we must not stop ourselves advocating and recommending and again and again and again and again that and lobbying politician and our uh, diplomatic mission that this uh, whole issue of formal informal because formal they are getting uh, uh, yeah minimum level of uh, acknowledgement and support but informal migrant those are coming from the bottom of the society those are excluded community those are not being able to afford very expensive uh, this recruiting fees and all these things and they are not being able to assisted by our diplomatic mission they are not being assisted by our bureaucratic mission they are not being assisted by um, other mechanisms when they return when they something happens abroad um, health issue protection issue they are uh, even uh, the the accident issue if the we know that how many dead bodies are um, still waiting uh, flights to get back home. So in this situation, how, how to define uh, migration uh, and labor diplomacy and what we're talking about and what we're trying to achieve, I think we need to come out some of the, some of the highlights and also the coordination issue. Another issue that the coordination I see when I was in Libya last year during the COVID high time, the repatriation flights and all these things were happening. Before that, I was in Afghanistan. I see that when I was dealing with our embassy in Pakistan for a uh, Nepali migrant is stranded in Afghanistan, seen as a, their passport visa, everything expired and they needed um, travel document to get back home. And our embassy in Pakistan, they were throwing ball to Delhi and Delhi were th throwing ball to Pakistan and the, both Delhi and Pakistan, they were throwing ball to uh, Kathmandu. So this is situation. Last year, Libya, same thing happened. Cairo said, I can't do anything. Doha said that this is not my area, what to do? And then the government was announcing that they were saying that, okay, there are repatriation flights, you contact your embassies, but people were contacting the embassy, the embassy's doors were not open. Phones were not responded and uh, their applications were not registered. So um, again, the whole issue around why that was happening, I myself talked to various ambassadors in uh, our ambassadors in Cairo and Qatar and uh, um, UAE. They were saying that, oh, they came through informal channel. We don't know who these people are. And uh, they are not part of our uh, package and they are not uh, part of my uh, protection mechanism. I don't... Uh, I, I, I don't have any responsibility. That was response from our uh, ambassadors and our uh, foreign affairs um, officials there. So here, the, 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 this is why I think this is uh, something that um, I really want to bring this issue and uh, get some responses from other speaker uh, as well. That where where uh, where to start to 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 discuss about migration policy, bringing foreign policy, migration policy, and the labor right issue together, and then uh, help uh, our politicians to acknowledge this issue, our he help our bureaucrats to understand this issue and um, move on. I stop here now. I will be happy to respond to some of the questions um, later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Meenachi. Your words are like the writings on the wall, very, very pragmatic, very realistic. And I'm sad to know about your experiences last year when you were working in Libya and Afghanistan and dealing with some of the most human aspects. And I agree that at times, not only in India, but in other countries as well, including India, we face a lot of red tapism and then misunderstanding, lack of knowledge about the bureaucratic processes, et cetera, which really harm the interest of uh, migrants, laborers, especially those who are from unorganized sector who are not so privileged and not part of upward mobility you know, trend. So migration even has a positive trend where somebody very educated is going outside for earning high, high, high ways, wages. But most of them are not so fortunate in Nepal or even in India. This is my finding. In India, I think almost 40 lakh Nepalese people are living. We can't ascertain the exact number, but uh, it, this is a rough data that about 4 million people have been living in, 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 in India. But sadly, we, we don't know much about them because no, no, uh, nothing has been formalized at, at the process level, at, 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 at the embassy or at, at the ministry, or even in, 
in 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 indian side so i agree with you that we need to look on all these issues from inclus inclusion point of view social inclusion point of view and yes of course there is economic dimension as well because you know it can't only be the part of foreign policy somewhere the mode of production has to be shifted to nepal nepal needs to be a center of production as well stop being too much stop its too much reliance on import so is as of now it's 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 behaving like a market you know marketing market economy is all right it's it's a, it's a, it's an import driven country as as on the date and there's there's need to look from the economic perspective as well what what more should be done so we will we'll talk about it at later stage um, in the in the meantime i'm inviting we don't have the privilege of having our dr jivan uh, baniya from social science baha he's he's not being able to attend the program we will miss him listening today uh, we have next speaker mr harish chandra ghimire from ministry of foreign affairs possibly he is the right person to answer some of your points harish chandra ji over to you sir if harish chandra ji has joined i think he's been no no atul jivan vanya is there harish chandra is also my my apology yeah, yeah, dr yeah. jivan dr jivan if you please please yeah yeah yeah, yeah. my apologies dr jeevan you all would like to listen you dr jeevan please mute it please unmute dr jeevan so nena ji please unmute unmute you uh, atul ji can i can i request uh, uh, to uh, to uh, speak uh, after someone Yes, sure, I'm, sure. I'm trying. I'm trying to connect. Uh, okay, okay. In that case, in that data. case, I'm inviting Dr. Kesab uh, Basial from Trivandrum University. Thank you. Thank My you. old friend, Kesab ji. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Atul. Yes, is Harry? Yes, yes. You are audible. Okay. And thank you very much to Parmut uh, in inviting me in this platform. And uh, uh, it's very uh, complex issue while uh, talking about uh, migration and uh, diplomacy. Uh, because uh, our migration is uh, very much uh, a higher level its volume is very much high and diplomacy is very much limited very much limited so we can see uh, uh, now 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 also i think uh, um, about uh, seven or eight eight uh, countries just in countries there are only two countries uh, in nepal's ambassador and the rest of countries there are no ambassador so you can see the importance of uh, uh, nepal's uh, priority of uh, nepal's uh, for their destination countries uh, for particularly nepali workers so uh, the picture uh, uh, is not only the gloomy from um, the, i think if you see the uh, globalization process uh, you can see that that brings the people a closer the before Uh, if you see the uh, before 90s and uh, uh, now nowadays you can see that that in, in that increasing interlink between the locals to the international market look out by court uh, uh, i think it's okay it is okay yeah yeah we can hear you uh, okay 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 uh, so we can see that uh, link is between the our rural villages The, the, those people are uh, staying there, and uh, their 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 destination countries. Uh, I mean, the, the global uh, um, uh, this international market. So, uh, and India uh, is the rem is the, remain the uh, I think largest destination countries uh, for Nepal important market, particularly for Nepali workers uh, since decades that we all know. And uh, Dr. Amina Kodal also also highlighted uh, that issue as well. so since a decade uh, they are going still this is a continuing phenomena uh, it is basically if you uh, uh, is uh, during the cold war cold war also they went different places and uh, different places uh, but it was limited particularly it was a limited places because that british war colonial rulers where they wanted to go they bring them as a Uh, armies or the coolies for their purpose so it is basically if you define it it within the framework of we can we can define it within the framework of a colonial legacy 
and that is still uh, yeah, this is a continuing phenomena in the uh, still the different dimensions and uh, while talking uh, to the labor diplomacy it is basically reflects the endorsement and incorporations of the labor issues uh, labor issues uh, uh, in their larger framework of the foreign policy and uh, uh, it is there is the latest uh, nepal's foreign policy uh, in some of the places uh, it it reflects about nepal's mi migration as well uh, but but uh, already director portel also said that uh, there is no particular specific uh, migration policy in nepal there is a, uh, that kind of a foreign uh, employment uh, policy and uh, that kind of act is uh, there uh, but if you see the uh, the, the importance uh, that this is not and uh, the role of particularly uh, dip uh, diplomacy that is that is tools that is tools the six to maximize the advantage and minimize the weaknesses of the job market particularly for uh, their their laborers or workers that should be assess the assess the economic conditions and the first by the mic migrant worker and identify that factors that can contribute to the result of the problems. But is, uh, the question is that whether this has been resolved or identified or not. There are different, uh, uh, there, there are different, different uh, platforms to deal to the, that level of diplomacy. A, there are uh, bilateral and uh, regional or a multilateral level as well. And we have uh, some of the countries is still uh, going on, but it's, uh, I think uh, seven or eight countries, there is a, a memorandum of understanding or bilateral agreement between the, uh, those uh, Nepal and that uh, destination countries. And uh, some of the countries are still uh, going on. And uh, I think uh, this week there is a meeting uh, about Nepal Qatar jointly meeting for uh, review the, their bilateral agreement. I think this week, uh, uh, first, uh, to, uh, first, uh, second, and third uh, December, that is. And uh, even regional, uh, there are many mechanisms, several mechanisms about the regional forums, and the uh, latest, I think, that have that uh, held in uh, that uh, the Abu Dhabi dialogue has been held, and uh, some of the some of the issues has been uh, highlighted uh, about the, that uh, um, uh, that conditions of particular issues of that origin countries. But not not uh, that because that forum is mostly uh, this, uh, this stronghold of destination countries, so it is very difficult to raise the questions uh, in the Abu Dhabi dialogue uh, forum. And of course, the multilateral forum, uh, this uh, UN is there, and uh, uh, ILO is, uh, is of course this uh, uh, presence is there, and their standard is most important while talking about the uh, labor issues and their conditions in uh, destination countries. And one thing is important while talking about the migration and the migrant and that uh, labor diplomacy, it is rationally of uh, labor diplomacy is based on the fact that Nepali workers uh, go abroad, not only for making their income, but it is also the destination countries that need them desperately. That is the truth. And they need our workers. They need our laborers. But that understanding of uh, that kind of understanding is very less while uh, ne while negotiating bilaterally uh, um, from our country. That that is that is a really um, uh, I think a very uh, not a good thing is that. So diplomat uh, working in different countries are mainly responsible for their citizens. Uh, and uh, but if you see the. Uh, uh, the the staffs and the resources and the very uh, you, you can see the very negligible that uh, uh, staffs and uh, resources to address our labor's issues and some other Nepalese uh, particular if you see the some diplomats we uh, we are uh, only the talking about the formal diplomat who who are who, who goes from their countries as a uh, as a diplomat and uh, but we are not talking about those, those uh, informal kind of, we can also uh, say that those uh, NRNs and those 
parties, political parties, and uh, uh, the organizations, sister organizations that are also working for their um, for their labors and working um, their, their 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 citizens. And, and while talking about uh, the conducting that uh, uh, diplomatic practices uh, to relate that also relates the particular while what is the governance of labor in origin countries how they governing i mean the how they sending how they how what is the, the recruitment processes that is that comes also the one of the major factor so while uh, uh, while conducting the diplomatic practices and uh, because why i'm saying that because uh, because of that policy uh, that that reflects uh, that reflects the, their their way of going destination countries and knowing the uh, real issues about destination countries and uh, because of that also in this uh, particularly for covid time and even before uh, that uh, that prevalent uh, uh, prevalence uh, high prevalence is high and while talking about the gender issues uh, that is also the dr portal has also highlighted uh, because of that to, that uh, that uh, case of Nepal is not allow, allowing to go to certain countries, and uh, they they have to go from the different different uh, by different countries, and they they consider as uh, I'm I'm not saying I'm ne I never said that kind of illegal and uh, those things, but I I must say that the undocumented the victims are undocumented and they are not getting the uh, proper uh, responsible uh, responsibility. From the uh, from the embassies, uh, embassies as well. So uh, I'm uh, thus uh, I'm not taking much time within one minute. So so, so th that's that is why uh, that bureau how what they do particularly uh, diplomats and uh, those bureaucrats and uh, taking they they are not taking the responsibility how to deal with but they they advise better not to come because. Uh, they don't want to take the responsibility. So, uh, and uh, one uh, more thing is that uh, while talking about the diplomats and something that uh, uh, they, they are in eight countries, they are labor attorneys and labor, labor council, councils in each countries, and uh, those people are uh, selected selected from the some other or the ministry, and uh, some other staffs are definitely that they goes uh, from the. Um, you know, the foreign ministry, and they have no, um, uh, we have, they have some very much, we can see the, uh, some of the, there, there's no coordination between the, that, uh, uh, even in uh, labor ministry and uh, foreign ministry. So in that uh, resource con constraint uh, uh, in situation also, uh, even though those we sometimes we see the there is no coordination and uh, coordination between that those uh, ministry so in, for that for in that uh, case also uh, in nepali workers working in distance countries are very much suffering uh, saying that i stop here and if uh, there is some other queries i'm ready to uh, I, I try to uh, say more things thank you atul Thank you. Thank you, Gesiji. Thank you. Uh, may, I, may I invite Dr. Jeevan Baniaji, please, if he is available and his network is working now. Dr. Jeevan. Hi, Atul. Uh, I'm sorry. It's, it seems like it's not working yet, but... Uh, now you're loud and clear. Now you're loud and clear. Fortunately, we can hear you. Okay, maybe I can do that uh, via my um, phone. Oh, that's all right. You can okay. keep your video off and, and uh, speak. Okay. Yeah. You please take your time, 10, 15, 12 minutes. You know. Thanks. Um, I think I didn't have much to uh, say. Uh, but just, we want uh, to hear from you especially because you are an expert in this area, unlike us, unlike me especially. Okay, please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank um, uh, Pramodji, nice uh, chair and my co-panelist. Uh, thank you for inviting me, and it's it's great to be uh, in this August uh, panel. Um, I very much uh, echo with uh, uh, what was uh, what was um, stated by uh, Minaji um, in the very outset about uh, Nepal not having 
I would say uh, active and uh, updated migration policies. So um, I would say that, you know, uh, the, the, the dynamics of migration, uh, it's ever changing. So it's very important for any nation state and the institutions that uh, we keep revisiting uh, and we keep reviewing uh, the migration policies and our diplomatic practices uh, and things like that. And then we should keep, um, keep uh, making changes uh, and we have to learn from the past and maybe there are things that we have to also unlearn. So uh, in that regard, I echo with Minazi that uh, we are not doing that, um, uh, especially uh, from the perspective of um, migration origin, uh, uh, origin country. Uh, without rep repeating what the previous speakers said, um, uh, I would like to, however, uh, emphasize that uh, I think most of our uh, lever, lever diplomacy, uh, because that is the focus of today's discussion. So um, most of the approach uh, in the past has been uh, either political or economic. Uh, and then the issue of labor migration um, uh, was uh, was not that uh, that much of an importance uh, for 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 uh, the leaders uh, run the state. However, at the same time, uh, the, the 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 migration is uh, has become such a multi-dimensional issue uh, that uh, the mig migration policy and migration diplomacy uh, has been shaped not only of that. Uh, of Nepal, but uh, uh, most of the destination countries, their diplomacy too uh, has also been uh, sort of affected or uh, shaped, uh, not only because of the, the, the economic need and the economy, but uh, there are uh, ranges of other actors uh, which have played a prominent role, uh, mostly the non-state actors, private agencies, let's say uh, supply companies, contracting companies, subcontractors, even agents, uh, and in some cases, maybe the INGOs and development partners, uh, they've, they've become uh, quite, quite proactive in shaping the uh, the foreign, uh, sorry, migration diplomacy and migration policies. Uh, so I think we have to be cognition of the fact that um, uh, that uh, given that these uh, migration policies and uh, diplomacy have been shaped by these various factors uh, and the institutions uh, and actors. Uh, we have to, we as a nation state uh, should also, uh, I think I very much agree with uh, Minazi here, uh, that we have to also account of this fact, that this is very important. And we have to keep studying how uh, labor diplomacy uh, has been operating, how it has been changing, and how it is going to be affected. I think we should be also be able to, um, uh, the project, um, given the, the, the present and the past, past experience and the present conditions, uh, which is not happening. Uh, and uh, I think uh, in relations to that, I think when we think about uh, having our migration policy or migration diplomacy, um, we have to also, uh, you know, acknowledge the fact that, uh, you know, everywhere I think in the world, uh, not only here in Nepal, but in the destination country also, mostly the non-state actors, private uh, recruitment agencies uh, and actors uh, also tend to sort of uh, cooperate as well as bypass uh, the regulatory mechanism, right? Uh, maybe some of the countries like uh, Saudi Arabia, maybe in terms of shaping migration policies and you know, um, have uh, their uh, labor diplomacy, the government and the private organizations are uh, closely cooperating. 
but um, many, many of the destination countries, uh, they also tend to uh, bypass the, 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 the bureaucratic uh, process and the structures uh, because of their own uh, vested interests. So I think um, in order to shape our diplomatic uh, uh, policies and uh, uh, plans, uh, I think we should also uh, regularly uh, study uh, their practices, how their diplomacy functions. You know, then the many uh, these uh, these policies and practices are not homogeneous across the destination countries. So whoever uh, is in charge of uh, in charge of let's say uh, you know shaping these policies as well as implementing them through diplomatic channels, including the diplomatic missions in the destination countries, uh, should be able to at least um, you know, understand these things. Uh, but unfortunately, what's happening here in Nepal is that um, I think those, except those who, uh, who work for certain times in certain uh, divisions uh, within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, they have designation, designated countries to look after. And I think if the, the bureaucrats specifically, uh, they go through uh, some kind of experience uh, in, their, in their career phase. However, there are different um, um, officials, um, administrative, technical, uh, and other kind of staff uh, deputed um, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, sorry, uh, diplomatic missions. Uh, they don't have proper understanding about how these diplomacy functions. So I think at home we have, uh, as Minaji mentioned earlier, we have a lot of things to uh, to uh, to do. Uh, so maybe we need uh, proper uh, training and orientations of, of of these officials who are fielded in the diplomatic missions. Uh, they should at least have some kind of understanding about the political economy, political, sorry, uh, social structures, how the diplomatic functions and things like that. Um, in one of the, uh, one of the uh, issues that Minaji mentioned about uh, um, the rescue and repatriation in the context of COVID, uh, especially in reference to, uh, to the countries where we don't have diplomatic missions, uh, that happened. It was, it was very obvious that uh, we would face a lot of challenges in terms of uh, rescue and repatriation, uh, um, uh, repatriation uh, uh, there. Uh, that's why I think we, we, um, we already know uh, where these kind of issues are going to pan out. Uh, where we will uh, we will have uh, difficulties in terms of crisis and say disasters and pandemic like that that we already know right we do have uh, four or five million um, people uh, in a single destination countries if uh, we are to face with this kind of unprecedented situations and we are to you know uh, bring them back uh, we can't do anything and we are not prepared uh, either. So uh, at least in, 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 um, in uh, those countries, I think um, uh, we already have scenario at, uh, at hand. So uh, we could prepare uh, accordingly, but unfortunately we don't have that policy about, you know, uh, not, not, neither the policy nor enough uh, resources uh, uh, for 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 that kind of uh, uh, that kind of uh, situations, uh, and um, when we talk about uh, uh, labor diplomacy, uh, I think um, uh, most of our approach, as I mentioned earlier, has been state centric, uh, which is very important because we do have uh, certain uh, bilateral uh, relations in place. We have uh, frequent joint committee meetings and things like that. Uh, in order to review our bilateral agreements and, and have discussions about the, uh, the, the Nepali migrant workers and, and, and the issue of uh, labor migration in general. 
Uh, however, um, I think uh, one thing uh, we have learned and we should learn from the experience of COVID-19 is that uh, we also might need uh, uh, track to diplomacy or we might also say the public diplomacy, right? Uh, and it, it was quite evident in, in the present context that uh, the state-to-state -state relationship really didn't help us, at least in terms of uh, protecting and um, protecting and um, uh, repatriation of uh, Nepali migrant workers. Um, and forget about the other issues. There are issues about waste thefts. There are issues about exploitations. There are issues about uh, destination country changing their laws that might curtail uh, the rights of the Nepali workers that might be against the bilateral uh, uh, agreements that we have with the destinations countries. Um, but uh, uh, what I'm saying here is that uh, it might also be very important, and depending on the countries, that's why I'm, I said earlier that we should be able to first understand how the diplomacy of particular country functions. Uh, but uh, I think that the track to diplomacy uh, or the public diplomacy is also very important in this context that maybe uh, in these kind of situations, uh, the the one to one political relationship, or maybe some of the political parties have their uh, institutional relationship with the political parties or the leaders or the government of the destination countries, or maybe even the single ambassador might have that kind of resources or the capital, social capital, right? So how do we build that social capital? How do we prepare our? Uh, maybe we should have a different uh, discussions on this, but. Uh, uh, how do we um, mobilize our diaspora, um, uh, you know, in order to uh, to talk to uh, the officials um, or the relevant persons in in these kind of situations through our uh, through our diaspora members, which who might be quite influential. You know, they do have the business relationship. They do have relationship with the employers, uh, which might be quite equally important or even more prominent sometimes. Uh, so um, I think um, uh, in this regards also, we are, uh, we are uh, lagging uh, behind. Uh, so, uh, uh, and the next thing I, uh, I think this is very, uh, very uh, important uh, that, uh, we also uh, should be uh, cognition of the fact that uh, uh, you know the the the, the uh, there are discussions about uh, the, the the world of work uh, changing uh, rapidly, but uh, oh, in the context of migration also you know because of the COVID uh, the recruitment supply chain uh, market. Uh, and its approach is also going to change, um, including in uh, because of the uh, the the, um, the technologies that uh, that um, we have. Uh, so there are debates about the virtual migration uh, to increase or likely to increase in the near future. That's one thing. And if the world of work is changing, um, how do we uh, how do we uh, uh, prepare our uh, human resources. It's very important. Uh, maybe uh, the jobs and the opportunities is going to uh, shrink for the Nepali migrant workers if uh, we are not already thinking about these things. So uh, I think we have to also account for uh, the, the potential uh, risk. Uh, I don't know whether it is a risk or it could be uh, the opportunity for Nepal or the Nepal's development if youth were to stay here in Nepal. Sometimes it might function uh, for, for, for good, but uh, uh, I think we have to account for the, the, uh, the, the, the uh, fact that the, uh, the likelihood of uh, migration without migrating, uh, migrating uh, is going to affect, um, affect our uh, uh, Nepali uh, migrant, uh, migrant uh, uh, workers. Uh, and uh, in the context of COVID, I think the, the, the next thing that we have to also, um, uh, we have to also uh, discuss uh, is that, you know, for some times we, we were having this discussions on uh, remittance uh, increasing even in the, con even uh, while the, the, um, uh, the impacts um, 
uh, were there on uh, Nepali migrant workers due to the COVID-19 situations. And I think that can be a separate discussions about why remittance increase and decrease and for whom and uh, by whom and things like that. However, now you can see that for last two, two three months, uh, the remittance is declining. Uh, there are issues, of, as I mentioned about uh, earlier, uh, the shrinking demands for the uh, for the uh, Nepali migrant workers and uh, countries like Saudi Arabia, even before the COVID and in the context of COVID, we can clearly see that the Bahrain and the countries like this are changing their policies uh, to provide uh, more job opportunities for their own citizens rather than um, bringing uh, migrant workers from uh, from other countries. So. What do we do in this context is very, very important. Uh, whether uh, whether we are preparing ourselves or we are about having um, some kind of dialogue or we have some diplomatic efforts or not is something that we have to uh, maybe um, um, discuss. But at the same time, you know, maybe there are uh, there are opportunities opening up, uh, like. In the recent uh, maybe news, um, uh, you are following uh, some of the countries like Germany are in need of agriculture workers. Uh, countries like UK are looking for hiring Nepali nurses. Uh, so, um, how proactively we are working? To what extent our diplomacy and our tools, diplomatic tools, uh, is working? Uh, uh, is very important. So the, my point is that we have to continuously study the, the, the situations, labor market situations, and the policy changes in the destinations countries um, in order to advance uh, the, the, the issues um, um, and um, the, the, the well-being uh, and welfare of uh, Nepali migrant workers. So I, I stop um, here. Thank you. Thank you, Jivanji. Excellent presentation. And you have covered a lot of, of, of parts which should be seriously looked by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and respective embassies. I have personally seen the works of Indian embassy, Nepali embassy in, uh, in India. And I'm happy to say that at least they had taken many initiatives, which really helped the people who were stranded after the uh, first out, outbreak of COVID-19 last year. And also they have been instrumental in uh, facilitating, uh, you know, safe, safe, safe passage to the, their home, as well as welfare, welfare stick supports. So there are good and bad examples, of course, but uh, as a whole, I agree with you, as well as Minazi, and of course, Kesabji as well, that there are many areas which call for immediate attention from the policy, from, from the policy makers, because everything can't be dealt only through the, you know, only through the support of goodwill. There has to be certain formal mechanism. And for that matter, yes, of course, the person charisma also matters. Like you have rightly said that it also depends who is the ambassador, who is where working. So th these are, are all very important aspects related to the subject which we are talking today. Thank you, we will be back to you once again. For now, I'm inviting uh, Neha Chaudhary, Ms. Neha Chaudhary, National Project Coordinator, Migrant Rights and Decent Work International Labor Organization. What do you know, Hazi? Um, hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yeah, clearly. Yeah, please go ahead. Can't hear you now, but sometime back you were audible. Nehazi? Uh, this is having some uh, yes yes so in the meantime in the meantime i'm inviting anurag devkotaji human rights lawyer to uh, please present his views on on the subject anurag ji hi thank you yeah please go ahead. all right um thank you so much for for this uh important platform and i uh i must admit that i'm left with not much to share um considering the extent of content covered by uh my previous speakers uh, so much has been uh, said and it, it has been a good learning for me and i'll just try to re-emphasize um, some of the points where necessary 
so, uh, so when we talk about uh, labor migration, particularly in terms of uh, uh, diplomacy, uh, and I'll try to be specific to Middle East with cognizance to the fact that uh, Middle East countries, particularly Gulf and Malaysia hosting, you know, 80 to 90% of Nepali migrant workers. Uh, so we'll leave aside the data of India bound migrant workers for now. Uh, the question before us is, where do we stand in terms of our transnational labor migration diplomacy? You know, what, what strategies or what tool do we employ in exerting these political leverages against these economically giant countries like Qatar, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, Malaysia, uh, given this huge, you know, uh, power of symmetries between the country like Nepal and these economically giant countries. So the tool, uh, tool of diplomacy that the countries of origin uh, like Nepal or, or the bargaining chip, I must say, uh, that Nepal holds against these economically giant countries could be summed up in one word. That's migrant workers, you know, the workers are the bargaining chips. Um, so, so it brings us to this theory of uh, migration interdependence, you know, the, the interdependence on labor migration uh, comes to our rescue, uh, which establishes the fact that political leverages are accounted on the basis of how interdependent these uh, receiving and state, uh, receiving states and sending states are on labor migration in, in general and the contribution of um, migrant workers in particular. So how reliant the political economy of both of these states are over labor migration, that's where comes in the compromising point, uh, in, in my opinion. So, and to substantiate that, uh, to substantiate my fact, there's this recommendation from uh, United Nations uh, Global Commission on International Migration, which establishes that a carefully designed temporary migration program are the means of addressing the economic needs of both countries of origin and the countries of destination. And I also agree with Minazi that this should go beyond just the economic needs. Uh, however, Assessing this from the lens of, you know, the economic interest, uh, this has been largely proved, you know, uh, where the GCC countries to a uh, differing extents have relied on um, foreign migrants to maintain their economy, you know, for instance, in consideration to the fact that uh, construction and manufacturing sectors being the largest contributor to GCC uh, countries economy, the economic growth of this country is currently mostly generated by migrant workers. While in Nepal, it has equal significance and equal gravity where we all accept the fact that remittance has been a stable source of, uh, you know, uh, income, national income. And there are evidences supporting that uh, uh, it has had its substantial contribution towards significant alleviation of poverty, hunger, uh, malnutrition, among others. So this, I think this brings us to another question where, um, where we must ask um, ourselves that whether we have been able to exert this uh, leverage against this receiving, uh, this receiving countries. Uh, so for that, my answer would be uh, yes and no. Yes, in reference to the example of Malaysia where the government took a firm stand in getting its stance inked into the bilateral agreement, uh, bilateral labor migration agreement. Yes, also in context of restricting the domestic workers to golf, although it is challenged in so many grounds, particularly on human rights, uh, particularly, particularly on the grounds of human rights. This is very, very challenging, but but restrictions uh, of migrant worker has been the strategy employed by uh, by these uh, uh, low-powered states, for instance, the government of Nepal. So this, uh, the restriction has been used as the political leverage and a bargaining chip against migrant dependent states. And I again reiterate and re-emphasize the fact that this is very, very challenging on grounds of human rights. Uh, and why Nepali migrant workers? Uh, because of their honesty, and their lesser crime records compared to other 
uh, South Asian labor migrants sending countries. So which has again been used as a bargaining chip in negotiating and uh, negotiating these uh, bilateral agreements between uh, the receiving states, for instance, uh, the Gulf or Malaysia and the sending, uh, sending state, for example, Nepal. And coming to the answer of uh, no, why no? Uh, because of ample of reason. Uh, to begin with, the everyday plights of Nepali migrant workers, you know, uh, exploitation from the employers, both physical and economic exploitation, inhuman treatment to non-payment of wages, low payment of wages, uh, and um, uh, and uh, and restriction of you know basic human rights, uh, including that of a food and that of an accommodation. So um, and that uh, and that one specific uh, uh, element that tops all of this chart is to me the lack of protection from the state. You know the weak presence of state in these countries, or to sum up a weak labor migration diplomacy. So speaking of the weak presence, you know, I would uh, re-emphasize the points highlighted by my previous speakers. You know, this, the, the embassy and the diplomatic missions abroad, especially in the Middle East, which hosts like large number of Nepali migrant workers, they're, they're weak and non-capacitated in terms of, you know, physical and human resources. And, COVID-19 was a timely reminder that we really need to up the game, uh, for instance, uh, by strengthening the capacity of diplomatic missions or you know, by providing support to migrant workers uh, facing exploitations and other abuses uh, that could be done by you know, establishing a redressal mechanisms or by providing legal advice and representations. <laughs> Uh, we need to ensure that these missions are adequately resourced, both in terms of data and information, uh, just to scrutinize the prospective employers as part of their demand letter attestation process, you know, which is doable, uh, given that the strong has a, the state has a strong political will. Uh, and, and I think this should get the ball rolling. So speaking of the political will, uh, example of Philippines, you know, it always comes to our rescue when we generally talk about the issues of labor migration governance. For example, you know, the Philippines has mobilized huge resources, both in terms of human and physical resources. You know, they have even established schools in destination countries for their migrant workers' children. So that goes by the name Filipino, uh, Philippine School Overseas. And they have like a solid immediate rescue mechanism they have their own hospitals you know these are some of these solid examples of what states should or could do in terms of better protecting their citizens uh, in in different destination countries so moving ahead there are a few things that we need to consider which has been like broadly uh, spotlighted by my previous uh, speakers just to not to repeat that just to quickly reiterate uh, I, I really think that it's high time we need to, you know, introduce a performance evaluation system at the embassy, uh, at the embassies and the missions abroad. Uh, if it's not there in place already, and as it, I agree in full terms with the GVNG that we really need to employ uh, track to diplomacy more often, and also uh, also uh, to you know reconsider the role of non-state actors in. Uh, in, de in devising this uh, uh, labor migration diplomacy, which, uh, which time and again has proved that uh, the non-state actors have a better stake in introducing better uh, policies at the destination countries, or you know, uh, reimbursing the unpaid wages to the migrant workers, or asserting better protection in destination countries. So this, there has been this growing uh, recognition of non-state actors, and we should be, and we need to be on the same page. That's what I think. Um, and also, we need to really optimize the diplomatic ties uh, with these economically giant countries. You know, uh, it, I think it should 
go beyond you know just sending the low skill migrant workers and consider taking more robust economic diplomat uh, for for example uh, more robust economic diplomacies like on trade uh, investment tourism technology transfer etc you know we need to like think uh, a bit you know bigger than what we have been considering at the contemporary phase and also considering the fact that uh, you know as jivanji rightly mentioned this is like the jobs are getting automated and machines are taking over human jobs uh, especially those you know employed by nepali migrant workers at one hand and at the other remittances having this dutch disease impact on nepali uh, economy we really need to think rethink and revamp our foreign labor migration policies it's time so for me it's both macro and micro level assessment of labor migration uh, diplomacy it's very imperative where the national interest at the macro level for instance the inter uh, the interstate relationship the political leverages and bilateral relationship maintained through bilateral labor agreement and mous should be counterbalanced by the protection of the rights and welfare of migrant workers at the micro level you know by effective um, execution of bilateral labor agreement execution uh, because you know we have uh, scaled up in terms of uh, the contents in the agreement uh taking for instance the recent agreement signed by uh, nepal but effective execution is something we really need to focus on uh, that brings to the end of my presentation thank you so much excellent anuragh uh, ji excellent presentation and i agree with most of your uh, points especially uh, as you have said that automation is behind the declining you know remittances to nepal i don't agree with that because this is caused by operational disruption at large but you but you are absolutely right in saying that in long term this has to be look, looked at because a, a skill upgradeation is one part where nepal must give the proper returns otherwise we will be keep facing the similar problem and so many other aspects which we will look a little later on uh, in the meantime i will invite samvita ji samvita patak ji to kindly give her presentation we'll have one more round of uh, interactions with each of us abita ji uh good evening everybody uh i'd like to share my screen erwin please allow yeah yeah i think they have allowed yes. is it visible yes yeah okay okay um uh having worked as a migration supervisor uh, in one of the ministerial projects uh, this is my learning uh, from the uh, small institution that is being run uh, at the federal level at the local level known as migrant resource center and i would like to make a relation in this presentation the how migrant resource center could be related to labor diplomacy and how uh, uh, local state institution could actually impact in our uh, foreign policy in our labor diplomacy uh uh, uh introducing about uh migrant resource center uh uh if we look at our uh economy uh, our remittances that we earn is equivalent to uh 1 by 4th of our gdp that's equivalent to one by four five gdp equivalent but uh when we talk about uh, the status of migrants in other countries nepalese migrants in other countries we are facing a lot of problems and that starts from the migration process itself in nepal and uh, so migrant resource center uh, was established with an idea so that uh, migrant resource center they could provide some kind of crucial information to this uh um, uh prospect migrants uh the migrants who are abroad so the major objective was to give a proper access to about the departure information on safe migration access to skill training because if you look at the status of nepal uh we have uh, around 74% of uh uh labor they, they who go abroad they are not unskilled around 25% 
semi-skilled and only 1% are skill leavers. So uh, the training, skill trainings are very important for their, for their sustaining in the abroad market. So we have been facing a lot of kind of, so it is very important to, to have an organization or institution uh, at the local level or at the federal level to at least assist these labor, the prospect labor to at least have some kind of skill training so that they do, do not face any kind of problem in, uh, outside their country. And similarly, uh, MRC is also providing some kind of uh, legal and paralegal uh, solutions for the uh, migrant abroad who are actually facing some kind of uh, problems or like giving information about the amnesty or what could be uh, done to actually minimize the illegal trains of migrants that is going abroad. And uh, there are certain uh, so psychosocial counseling that is being provided by uh, SDC based uh, a project called uh, Safer Migration, that's SAMI in Nepal. And uh, we also have um, other, other kind of uh, information, for example, um, so uh, talking about the status of MRC in Nepal, as of now, we have uh, 38 MRCs that is being run by uh, SAMI project, which is under, uh, which is under so Swiss development cooperation. Similarly, four, 14 by uh, Samridhi that is under MOICS and IFAD. And similarly, we have airport information takes at the in Trivan International Airport. And <clears throat> we have the other one mentioned side and everything is being controlled by one of the uh, that's national migrant resource center uh, which is a which is being run by the foreign employment board uh, uh, which is under is a autonomous body of uh, MOLIS. Uh, it's a ministry of labor employment and social security so uh, let me tell you about uh, the uh, what is the status of uh, MRC right now and what's the future so um, basically uh, uh, right now uh, if you talk about how the MRC is being run then we could if we talk about uh, SAMI project the safer migration project under STC and MOLESS -E uh, the Ministry of Labor employment so they are basically providing uh, they are giving their contract to the local service provider to run their project in the municipality in the local municipality some of the projects are being run itself by the municipality and ruler municipality and some of them are being run under the provincial government structure so basically these mrc are set up in uh, the district administration office where from where the passport is actually issued so that when the laborers they come to make their passport or who are the prospect migrants who wants to go abroad they can uh, they are asked by the counselors that what's the purpose of going outside from the country and why why they are going where they are going what is the state of the country how they give you some kind of guidelines so uh, this is the present status of the Thing. They are also providing uh, different kind of literacy programs to these prospect migrants or migrants or migrants families about the what's the status. If, uh, for example, if you talk about a national migrant resource center, they are the one who interact with all the MRCs in the country, and they are trying to interact about the changing policies in labor diplomacy abroad. If there is some kind of uh, change in labor diplomacy in Qatar, that is informed to the Migrant Resource Center all around Nepal. And Migrant Resource Center is the one who is providing the uh, simple uh, uh, information, the uh, proper information to the migrants coming to them uh, to know about the status of the country, where they are going, or where their family members are working, and what kind of policies will uh, change their uh, labor status in that country. So uh, uh, as per, uh, since Nepal just drafted its local government, local, local governance operation act in 2017, it states that uh, it is the uh, highlight of local government to actually um, give some kind of 
information regarding the foreign employment and data collection about the foreign employment status in their municipality. It is, it is, it has been a criteria set up for this local government in this federal government structure of ours. So I think uh, since MRCs are being set up in the local institution, from in the local setup in the district administration office, especially being run by uh, the local municipality today uh, in the support of, of course, the big institutionalism, big multilateral institution and bilateral institution, even though they are supporting it. I think uh, local government has a, has a mandate of actually providing information and MRC is a good network and a good institution to actually connect the federal government to the people through MRC. So it is an institution set up. Now, uh, I would like to give an example of Thonkuta municipality. Otul uh, sir is uh, from India. So Thonkuta is a very prominent uh, yes, water uh, district down. in our uh, country. It actually is a connecting. Uttar Pradesh. It's a road connectivity to uh, uh, four prominent districts. Yeah, it is in the Eastern Nepal and it is one of the very um, uh, road access of uh, two four other major districts in Nepal. So this municipality is a very highlighted municipality in the Eastern region. And um, uh, I, my uh, learning from this uh, municipality has been that um, Donkuta has been doing quite well about uh, the setup of MRC. Uh, right now, Donkuta, after the COVID pandemic, it realized that uh, while it was collecting for its uh, 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 returnees and the migration status of its uh, municipality, it realized that MRC was one of the network to actually connect with it, the people who have gone to uh, for migration or the migrant families or the prospect migrants who are interested to go abroad. So I think Dankuta had realized that and it also drafted, it has recently issued foreign employment integration policy in 2078. And uh, uh, similarly, uh, it has been conducting it has been conducting um, MRC as a main agent uh, to actually connect to the central government about the issues related to migration. So uh, it has been also giving information about the domestic employment opportunities. Right now in Nepal, we have a very important program going on that is Prime Minister Employment Program. So MRC has been a connecting space to actually let the um, uh, the prospect migrant also know about the opportunities here, also giving uh, information to the returning migrants who have come back about the uh, municipality level program or uh, national level program, um, prime minister employment program. Uh, being a student of international relations, uh, I would also like to uh, talk about the liberal institutionalism and labor diplomacy, how it is connected. If we talk about institutionalism, the real institutionalism in IR, they tell that if there is a small kind of uh, common problem that is going all around the world, then if liberal institutions, they come together, then there is an easy um, access to it or there is a solution of this kind of problem. So I don't think uh, migration issue is only limited to Nepal. It is also limited to all, most of the labor standing countries. Uh, rightly, uh, uh, Anurag Dev Kota, he spoke about uh, how Philippines had been, a, so, uh, had been one of the most influential labor standing countries regarding their policy, regarding their institutionalism. Um, I agree to him because uh, since uh, I, when uh, I will talk about the good practices in uh, MRC all around the world. I will take example of uh, our uh, Philippines. Uh, so further in Nepal, if we talk about liberal institutionalism, yeah, these all projects which are running MRCs, uh, which is being hand over to the gov local government by end of the project. Most of the project is being run by the bilateral and multilateral institution in Nepal, like IOM, ILO, uh, IFAD, uh, then we have Swiss Development Cooperation. We have um, Windrock International uh, working for the setup of Migrant Resource Center in Nepal. And at the end, 
this has to be handed over to the local government. But the status, uh, the position is still not so satisfying. But uh, if uh, the federal government actually uh, targets towards having a proper institution, like the, uh, the theory of institutionalism I uh, suggest, then I think that there would be a proper labor diplomacy because at end of the day, labor diplomacy is uh, a medium of foreign policy that targets our uh, uh, labors, migrant labors, and our national interest uh, is what our foreign policy defines. And our national interest is obviously to protect our people wherever they go or from wherever they, they start. And I think migrant resource centers should be institutionalized so that uh, before going for, uh, for going outside the country, it's better to know the proper information in our local institution itself. So uh, I may talk about um, good practice of migrant resource center. Uh, like in, for example, in Ethiopia, a lot of uh, um, a lot of um, migrants they opt for. Uh, migration in uh, Bahrain. So in Bahrain, what they have done is not that some individual unions and trade unions, especially Chamber of Commerce of Ethiopia, have done some kind of uh, uh, um, agreement in 2015 regarding their uh, protection of their or MRC services uh, for uh, Ethiopians in Bahrain, uh, so that uh, when they uh, go from Ethiopia itself, they can get some kind of information. And similarly, when they go to a destination country like Bahrain, they have a migrant resource service there also. So they can, Ethiopians can get uh, service in their own native language. So it's more easy to uh, understand and it's more easy to get in touch. So individual unions also have gone. Similarly, uh, 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 this Migrant Workers and Overseas Filipinos Resource Center of Philippines have actually identified that their migrant resource center is extension of their embassy services. So like Anuragji told about how uh, Philippines has been doing exceptionally well, they have also integrated their migrant resource center because they believe that migrant resource center is a, a center which actually accumulates the people thought and uh, people connection uh, so they have integrated this migrant resource center into their foreign services. It's an extension of their embassy service. Uh, so um, my learning, uh, working with uh, MRCs, MIDs, supervising them, I learned that it's very necessary for Nepal country because our country is totally dependent, like one by fourth of our economy is equivalent to the uh, remittance earn, but uh, just like when Mina just said that we eat with migration, we run with migration, but there's no proper policy with it. And, and there should be some kind of institutionalism as well, so that our uh, our migration is actually identified, our labors are protected wherever they go. So I believe that, uh, that Nepali diplomatic mission should identify the Migrant Resource Center, the National Migrant Resource Center should have some kind of diplomatic touch. There should be some kind of programs launched for it. Similarly, uh, there is a MRC in our passport department also, very unrecognized. Even we go and ask there about uh, in department of passport where the MRCs are. I don't think there is a proper space given to it. Similarly, we have, um, uh, so, I believe that MRCs are still not uh, being accepted by the local government. As of now, only 15 MRCs are actually being recognized by the local government. They have taken the full ownership, but uh, with time, as promised, the MRCs being an important institution to connect uh, migration, uh, labor migration and labors, it should be owned by the uh, uh, local institution, local level, and similarly, uh, just like I give an example of Ethiopia and uh, uh, Lebanon, similarly, Nepalese diaspora and, and 
civil society organization, migrants union abroad should be taking this thing into consideration, the institutionalism of MRCs. And similarly, there should be regular coordination between the federal government and the MRC so that they know about the changing trends, about the changing, and also uh, a very important stakeholder for uh, uh, advising about the uh, Nepalese labor diplomacy. <coughs> uh, and there is a lot of redundancy as seen in the country because uh, at the same time, uh, ne Nepal embassy also, as there is lack of coordination, we see Nepal embassy also working for same thing. We see uh, MRC being run by MIX is also running for same thing. We also see uh, Sami project coming to same thing. There are sometimes two MRC in the same municipality, which is a uh, waste of resource and a waste of uh, people attention. So I think that should be redundancy should be uh, removed and certain uh, criteria, certain TOR should be recognized for that institution at that municipality or by the federal government or the by the local government. And similarly, um, one of the best thing about democracy is that where people are involved and if people do not know about this today we have local level because uh, uh, we have gone into local government structure we have gone to the federal government structure where people uh, get to access single darbar even at their doorstep so i think community interaction should be increased there should be programs like pre-departure orientation it should be increased similarly pmd where uh, PMD, which promotes the idea of global compact on migration. Similarly, financial literacy about how to utilize these uh, remittance money should be given and some other community approach programs should also be held so that we uh, establish migration as an institutionalism to promote our labor diplomacy from the grassroots. Thank you. Thank you, Samvitaji, for a technically pure presentation. I really liked it. Thank you very much. We will have a, a brief round of you know, uh, interaction once again. In the meantime, I'm inviting Nehazi. I think she has joined us. If she can unmute herself. Oh, hi, Atulji, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yes, yes. Welcome, oh. Nehazi. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. And uh, apologies to everyone. I no, no, it's all right. It's all right. With my internet. <laughs> uh, uh, but then, um, uh, good evening um, and uh, to everyone attending. Uh, my co-panelists have already raised all some of the key concerns that Nepal faces in relation with uh, labor diplomacy. So I guess my remarks will be more on re-emphasizing what's already been said, um, particularly uh, some of the points that have been raised by Minaji, Jivanji, and uh, Onraji. Um, I, I think all the, the all my previous uh, co uh, speakers have like um, indicated as to how labor migration has consistently played a very big role in the Nepali society. Um, we've moved from um, initially a very restrictive migration policy to ensuring uh, safe and orderly migration, and now the national rhetoric being that we ultimately want to put stop to migration um, um, uh, or uh, make migration a choice uh, per se. But then this uh, can prove to be quite a difficult feat uh, considering you know, the contribution migration makes um, not only economically, but then how it's become a key uh, driver for socioeconomic transformation for families, communities, and the nation in itself. Um, um, having said that, we also know that uh, labor migration uh, comes with its own sets of problems where exploitation of migrant workers is uh, uh, is something that's like quite uh, significant and it comes uh, up again and again. But then there are certain other key issues that have uh, also emerged in uh, recent years, uh, which include lack of decent employment opportunities for migrant workers in these countries of destination, um, the lack of monitoring mechanisms, or even um, lack of uh, mechanisms for mutual skills recognition, so on and so forth. So to address these problems, labor diplomacy is a concept that's being floated around 
quite a bit, especially uh, in the context of Nepal. If we look at, we, if we go in and look at the textbook definition of labor migration di uh, diplomacy, it actually says the endorsement and incorporation of migrant labor issue in the foreign policy of a country. And I think the issue with the policy um, has already been uh, identified initially by Minaji, but then uh, the, there have, uh, the, the, it, it's been um, complemented by comments from other co-panelists as well. So I'm not going to go into the detail of that. Um, but then one of the examples uh, of, um, uh, of doing this is bilateral labor migration agreements, which as previous speakers have said, like the Nepal government has uh, managed to sign nine uh, bilateral uh, lab uh, labor migration agreements with you know, some of the key countries of destination. However, the implementation of these agreements uh, remain elusive. Um, if the labor migration diplomacy framework is adopted and implemented effectively, it can actually act as a very important stepping stone, especially for migrant sending countries like ourselves to ensure protection of our workers. But then not only do, will it support in the um, uh, support in the protection of the rights of our workers, but then it can also be a very key tool to strengthen bilateral relations with these countries. But then for this, I think, and this is a key point that I want to like bring home, and I think Anurag sort of concluded with that, is uh, the fact that we need to broaden our understanding of labor migration diplomacy beyond just using migrant labor as a bargaining chip. Like, you know, we do understand that we can leverage on the fact that these countries uh, of destination need labor, and which is why we some at some point we do have an upper hand. However, we can't just like be complacent and stop at that. We need to go one step further uh, and um, see what are the other avenues. And um, um, I know every other co-panelist has brought in Philippines here, but then uh, I think uh, there are some examples from countries like Philippines where based on exchange of labor, Philippines has also managed to establish trade relations with some of the key countries of destination which in turn has enhanced their capacity to demand for better protection for their citizens working in these countries. Um, a, a capacity assessment of diplomatic mission uh, conducted by uh, a team constituting of officials from Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as well as Ministry of Labor in uh, between uh, December 2020 and, uh, oh no, no, sorry, December 2019 to February 2020, which was supported by the ILO, did identify that there is a scope to expand our diplomacy in these countries and other aspects. And uh, I think these areas have already been highlighted by Anurag, where he talked about tourism, technology, trade, and other forms of investments. The same report however, also stated that Nepali diplomatic missions who have this primary, res primary responsibility, is, uh, are, especially in the Gulf and Malaysia, are functioning with very limited uh, financial and human resources. Uh, so there is, uh, like my uh, co-panelists have said, and we emphasize the need to strengthen the capacity of our diplomatic missions. Um, uh, this can take place in terms of addition of human resource who are going to support not just the labor diplomacy, but then also political, economic, cultural diplomacy and how these need to come together uh, for us to sort of really um, like build on uh, the labor diplomacy to create a better uh, working mechanism that will ensure protection of our migrant workers, but then also uh, support in a larger term goal of making migration sustainable, because this is not something that we can rely on uh, for um, the rest of our lives. Uh, the second uh, thing, I think uh, this was something that Jibanji particularly focused on was also to sort of um, enhance the research capacity, the fact that labor market and life in general is uh, dynamic and that we need to be prepared and we need to have an understanding of changing trends, not just within the labor market, but then also the social political changes, which and um, uh, there is a need of capacity to actually then um, understand these changes and strategize how we respond to these changes. And this obviously needs to happen at the level of diplomatic missions because uh, at this stage, we are the ones in the forefront of um, forging any sort of uh, facilitating any form of uh, diplomatic relations. But then like uh, 
um, uh, micro bandwidth subset, we need to go beyond that after, after a certain point, uh, which is why like, you know, um, at this point, it might not be possible for us to like to really like revamp uh, the structure of our embassies and so on and so forth. So there, this is where social dialogue plays such a key role, where uh, coordination between various government uh, bodies is very important and also um, coordination with stakeholders outside of the government is very key. And um, uh, just to sort of get like a, a, a broader understanding of social political issues. So I guess like I'll end my remarks here because um, everything else has been said before and I don't want to repeat anything. I would rather leave some room for discussion. Um, um, but then uh, thank you so much, Atulji. Thank you, Nehazi. Thank you, Nehazi. You have been, you know, very prompt, very crisp, as well as very detailed too uh, in your presentation. Thank you very much. I've seen Meenaji taking notes uh, since since, since the, we have started. Uh, would like to know Meenaji if she has anything to add, add in her perspe perspective. Meenaji, and if you can also some of the deliberations to an extent. That's the difficult job to some of the deliberations, but. Uh, um, thank you, Atulji. I just wanted to comment or uh, I don't know is aid or comments that what I was listening yeah. for other panelists and also I was checking the chat box. There are no questions, maybe people are tired. In terms of the training and there are a couple of things I just want to get more clarity myself and also the comment. In terms of the training of um, labor institution, labor ministry, all these uh, DOFE people and uh, Foreign Employment Board. I don't agree that they need training because if you go through the recent uh, annual report of Ministry of Labor and Social Protection, uh, so more than 60% budget is spent for the capacity building of these officials, just tickets and the hotels and the DSAs. I'm sorry to say that this money is from migrant labor's remittances. Okay, so we don't need their capacity building. We have to change their attitude. Yes. And we cannot change their attitude. They have to change their attitude because they are, they are uh, actually um, enjoying their life with the public taxes, including migrants' remittances. And um, this is this is unfortunate situation that uh, we are spending so much resources for these uh, uh, officials, and including embassy people, attaches, and all those things. But uh, the performance is not satisfactory. So what do we do in this situation? That is one. Another is, uh, um, again, the link with that, uh, this is not an um, uh, issue of lack of resources, lack of vision, and lack of attitude, lack of appetite. You have capacity, you have vision, you have energy to empower recruitment agencies, but you don't have capacity, you don't have attitude, you don't have resources, you don't have anything to empower your migrant, those are sustaining this country's economy. This is discrimination. This is totally, totally biased yes. uh, against migrant, biased by the politician, biased by the polit political institution, biased by the government institution, administrative institution, including embassies and all. So I don't see any problem with the resources. I don't see any problem with the, the, the scope, but it's a problem with the vision that is one. Another is that um, I just wanted to comment on Neha's uh, presentation, bilateral labor agreement, yes, which is good point. And uh, government is actually expanding horizon to get more agreements and agreements. I prefer to go for G2G, but G2G, they are not um, willing to do more G2G because they don't get commission from the, from the recruiting agency so much. And the recruiting agency, they cannot exploit migrant. They were, the way they are exploiting through the uh, selling migrant abroad uh, because also our recruiting agency's capacity is not that um, uh, politically powerful because comparing to the recruiting agencies at the, the, the Dalals and the agents of destination countries. So they are exploiting labor migrant, uh, the migrant back home, but they are not being dealt with these counterpart at the destination. So labor agreements are a technical document these are not diplomatic framework. That is why we need uh, migration policy and that link with the foreign policy and then the, that, uh, that dictate 
uh, our embassy's role and also monitor these um, uh, the labor mobility and the protect migrant worker um, abroad, uh, including India. That is one. And then uh, another issue I wanted to highlight, what was that? Oh yeah, this, um, uh, I was working with IAM, still I'm with IAM, but now in sabbatical, that's why I don't uh, mention IAM here. Um, IAM has been leading, including uh, with ILO and STCs and other counterpart that, uh, by, uh, sorry, the, the, the various forums, Abu Dhabi, Colombo Process, GFMD, uh, now the Global Compact. These are, again, uh, these are, these are, um, to some extent, these are diplomatic uh, framework, but is induced by uh, UN system and external agency, not by our own government. So, and uh, how much benefit we are getting out of this document? We are a member of all of these because we are very good on getting membership and uh, clapping and uh, I mean, uh, attending meetings, but how much benefit we are getting through these documents to protect the rights of our migrant? So I think this is a big issue. Again, the point is that is why we need migration policy. What is our migration policy? We don't have migration policy. We have a Foreign Employment Act, all these um, mechanisms, strategy, procedure, all these administrative uh, forms and administrative uh, documents we have. We don't have migration policy. That is why we need that. So, and another, I, I, I forgot to mention uh, earlier, I wanted to add that uh, the role of NRNs, when you talk about, when you think about migration policy, we really need to consider that role of NRN. The role of NRN, I'm sorry to say that again, in my own research, it came out very clearly, role of some of the NRNs are very similar to role of recruiting agencies, basically uh, uh, acting or uh, functioning as a smugglers. NRN means non-resident Nepalese, right? Sorry? NRN means non-resident Nepalese. Non-resident Nepalese. Yeah, yeah Nepalese. So when they come to Nepal, when they do their drama here, conferences, all these things, yeah. and president, prime minister, minister, yes. everybody, they are there and they are promoting their businesses, they are promoting their image, they are appreciating their role. But when migrants are getting in difficult situation abroad because of COVID, because of other um, situation, Nobody bother even thinking about migrant, how to bring them yeah. back. Those are sustaining our economy and those are sustaining uh, uh, country. So this is this is what I see the discrimination, the very class discrimination. I absolutely agree, Minazi, because uh, when we talk about ne Nepali migrants, we also have to think about well off. More, many of them are well off, truly well off. They are highly exactly. paid. They are highly paid and they are very much indifferent. Yeah. to the sufferings of those who who are at, at the bottom of pyramid so really the sensitization level has to has to grow up undoubtedly i completely agree with you yeah. Minazi, uh, i'm recalling i'm recollecting something which you said at outset that roti beti ka saman that is a man, that is a feminist manifestation or wrong kind of manifestation so which what new nomenclature do you, do you think will will be suitable for defining no, Indian um, I think that this roti beti is very sexualized term. So, I'm, and very so gender, my humble uh, request is what what you you propose as a new new uh, nomenclature? Um, um, well, um, uh, um, look at the migration between India and Nepal is economic and cultural migration. Yeah. So why not we call them migrant instead of saying roti beti? Why we use that very sexualized and the very gender insensitive word? We have so to see why, why we need to. It's a migrant. Indian migrants are coming here. Or Nepal yes, yeah, of, of course. Going there, that's of it. course, of course. It's remittances, migrant. remittances are coming from Nepal to India as well. This is another yeah. point. Point to be looked at. Yeah, yeah. So compli uh, complementarity, complementarity is there, and we have to, I think, you use that nomenclature in your view. Yeah. And uh, having having friendship treaty and that's the privilege and benefit we are using because we we do cross border marriages cross border family connection which is great that's yeah. the cultural thing but yeah. why we are saying that roti beti forget all these things <coughs> yes roti is economy yeah we should leave the spirit human mobility that's yeah. it living the spirit is something different and then giving it Typical nomenclature is, is something different. It's very stigmatized to me. I mean, um, being migra migration, um, I mean, I, I don't uh, use that term here, but uh, mm -hmm. 
researching migration, uh, looking at gender dimension and sexuality. So this is very yes, stigmatizing. Yes, absolutely. Any, yeah. any other speaker, if you have any anything to say in a one, one minute, you. one and a half minute? Thank you, Milad. Neha ji, Samdita ji. Neha ji, you first. Can I come in? Yeah. Yes. Yes. You are. Uh, uh, thank you, Arthurji. Um, or, or I, if you, or if, if you have any question to me as well, all, all the speakers. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, I guess like I just wanted to step in because I think um, there are some points that Mina Ji has raised right now that I agree with, and some points that I don't necessarily agree with. Uh, I don't agree uh, with the fact that uh, we cannot consider bilateral labor migration agreements as diplomatic framework. It is a diplomatic framework. It's between two countries. And uh, obviously, the implementation has remained an issue. And, uh, you know, the content has been quite shallow. And that's something that we've, uh, um, we've seen quite a bit in terms of the earlier agreements that were signed, which was basically very procedural, and which is also um the case with uh, our uh, policy like Nina she has said and that's uh, that's something that i agree with in the sense that uh, can see the lack of coordination between um very in like various ministries internally like where you know for instance in in the context of nepal it's ministry of labor and ministry of foreign affairs that needs to come together and work jointly for the protection of our uh, of migrant workers, but which uh, doesn't necessarily happen, and and I guess like this is where I agree with Minaji when she says there is a lack of vision, and um, the fact that if we do want an effective and a, um, a, a labor uh, a diplomacy to be put in place, there needs to be a larger political willingness and a recognition of migrant workers as um, as contributors to our economy. And I think that's where I want to end uh, my, my remarks on because um, until unless we recognize migrant workers as being significant, I don't think we will ever uh, then learn to leverage on what's, yeah. what they do for us to then look at a much more sustainable solution. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate the way you have dealt with the uh, topic, I mean, migration. But what if, if I ask that, what do you suggest to end it? End it or alter it to an extent? And, and what, how you will propose a new, alternate, new or alternative uh, developmental paradigm for that? Do you have anything in mind to stop this you know, very high rate of migration and painful migration, I must say? At... Um, I think a lot of points that Jivanji has raised earlier in his remarks are working towards making uh, migration um, safe, orderly, and regular. Like, you know, um, the thing is like we can never stop migration. Migration has been part of- no, I'm not, no, I'm not saying about to stop it. I'm saying what, what, what about the idea like making Nepal, make for Nepal kind of thing. Mm -hmm. At mm -hmm. a lower scale, I'm, it, it should not be compared with, it should not be seen in binary like India or any other large country. Yeah. But, yeah. but self-sufficiency to an extent, mm -hmm. to, to, lower, to lower down the dependence on, uh, you know, import. To, to, to create a better balance between import and export. These all things are basics. I think exactly. Nepali politicians should learn about it. No, definitely, definitely. And I think like one of the key reasons, like obviously um, reasons of migration differ um, in relation to say gender, in relation to other uh, forms of social uh, stratification. But then uh, one of the key reasons people leave is the fact that there is no decent employment available. Yeah. Yeah. It's not employment, it's decent employment. And this is something that ILO has been working um, hand in hand this, with. This is a status quo, but uh, but if there will be a, a force, I think there will be number numbers of new employments. You will be surprised to know, and I'm sure you must be aware about it, that former Prime Minister K.P. Bhattarai was one of the first proponents of social inclusion theory in South Asia. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, uh, mid 1990s onwards, Nepal entered into a different kind of a spiral. And, that is a separate thing. I would not like to comment on that, what happened after that. And, you know, it's a, it's a maturing democracy, no doubt. It's a very good democracy, functional democracy. But somewhere, somewhere in the, in the transition, I think that appetite was lost for, inclu for inclusive growth. So recently I came out with a new publication, an alternative de development paradigm for Nepal. It's, it's the collection of articles written by uh, former finance minister, Mr. Mathkore Sevirana, and some of them which we jointly had written. So if possible, you please have a look on it. It's a, 
I, I, I have been personally influenced with his, his wisdom. He had a, had a solid vision for Nepal. Anyway, thank you, Nehazi. Now, Sambhi Razi, quick remarks from you. Uh, One minute. Uh, uh, it was so, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, it was such an insightful uh, forum to uh, actually take part in and be a part of it. Um, like, um, I'll start with uh, uh, Mina Ma'am's uh, uh, presentation. Like, she talked about uh, the lack of uh, migration policy and which is very important for Nepal because uh, even when we talk about uh, diplomacy of Nepal, like priorities of Nepal, the uh, diplomatic priorities of Nepal, uh, Nepal being one of the um, labor sending state and, uh, and having a poor labor diplomacy in the world, we have not uh, seen Nepal priority towards diplomacy at that top priority. <coughs> And even there's no policy made on it. So it's a sad state condition of for our state uh, because uh, when we look at the diplomacy status in Nepal, we first talk about our neighborhood policy, then multilateral institution policy. And I think labor, pol labor diplomacy goes towards like seventh or eighth position when we talk about labor diplomacy in Nepal. So that's one of the very sad um, ending of our diplomacy like there should be some kind of improvisation towards it because uh at just like i said in my presentation that foreign policy is towards national interest and no better national interest than protecting its people i think labor diplomacy should be prioritized in further days similarly um jivan Banya, i would like to address him as so because he was my teacher in the university <laughs> and um Jivan Banya sir talked about the diaspora, how diaspora could actually influence in the uh, labor diplomatic uh, solution, like diplomatic uh, relations. So I think diaspora being Nepal being one of the, there is a diaspora of Nepalese all around the world and mostly in the uh, labor centric countries as well. So I think diaspora plays an important role, like the importance of NRN, uh, making their influential in labor diplomacy and all in that. So I think okay. uh, there should be one kind yes. of, some kind of gain sh should be done yes, for yes. with the diaspora diplomacy as so well. We have to see so it like it's glass, glass, so glass I think that's half full, rather half empty. We have to see it like glass half full. Yeah. Glass half empty. Yes, okay, yeah. 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 Only, only two sentences I want to add. Uh, one thing, first of all, if you see the Nepal India migration and those things, if you wanted to improve, let's start from the uh, review the Nepal uh, Nepal India friendship treaty that is uh, pending. Even APG report, what is uh, uh, what was it? I, we don't know about it. Uh, that uh, it requires to start from that point. And second thing is that this the diplomacy, whatever diplomacy you say. Uh, labor diplomacy uh, is uh, the tools of foreign policy and uh, domestic policy uh, foreign policy is the expansion of the domestic policy so yes. we, we we can uh, see if the what is the happening in internal yes. matters that can't, is the refle reflection of the a, yeah can't yes. see both in isolation both are interlinked yes that yes. is the, yeah. that is that is the fact yeah. and so third thing is that what uh, and uh, Mina, okay. I said that yeah. uh, that uh, diaspora, what he, what he, she has said, yes, that's the conditions of diaspora. I am fully agreed on that. On that yes, point. Thank, thank you, thank you, yes, thank, thank you, Atul. thank you. Thank you. Jivan ji, if you are around, just for thirty seconds or forty seconds, quick remarks, because we are seriously running out of time. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Final words from you. Um, yes. Just just wanted to clarify. I think the, that question was directed to me about uh, some of the NRN members being problem okay, yes. for uh, Nepali migrant workers. I agree. Uh, I have also been making that kind of statements, but uh, I think we have to be quite cautious about um, you know not uh, generalizing every uh, diaspora. That's why I used the word diaspora. So it includes not only migrant workers, but employers maybe the business people or the students and things like that so there are multiple avenues that we can explore in order to advance uh, the interest of uh, the nepalese and um, and <coughs> one thing and uh, 
I think just to just to compliment on um, Atulji's your questions to uh, Nehaji about uh, alternative development yes. and something like that. I think um, first of all, uh, in the context like Nepal, I think we have to uh, keep our house in order first. So, yes. so that might require uh, absolutely lot of lot of lot of um, changes um, at home, including uh, policy plans mm -hmm. and. Um, um, the way that we work, but um, uh, I think this is something that um, I have been uh, saying. But I just would like to reiterate that one of the uh, one of the tools um, uh, that uh, I think uh, tools of empowering we are talking about empowering migrants uh, would be to also provide. Um, uh, the political rights to the migrant workers uh, that might uh, function uh, and that that can empower these migrant workers to uh, have some kind of uh, you know uh, to to enhance some kind of accountability in the part yeah. of uh, Nepali leaders and uh, institutions um, uh, at home in um, in all kind of uh, uh, yeah. kind of situations uh, so. Uh, how do we do that? It's very challenging. Uh, that's one one of the ways. But at the same time, I think there are ways that uh, this can be done at home. Also, uh, I think uh, they have to be um, mobilized and organized. Uh, you know, the fact that they are very much fragmented and not organized, and they don't have <coughs> a voice to uh, put out, and maybe. They are fragmented uh, because they've been co-opted or maybe divided by various um, political party interests Absolutely. that that we have. So I think we have to find different strategies to mobilize yes. and empower them and organize them both at home as well as yes, the, professional institutional culture as well as welfareism. Welfareism have to be imbibed, imbibed somewhere in the political system, polity, polity right. of Nepal. Right. This is my reading too. Thank you. Uh, uh, everyone, all the participants, it, was, it, was, it has been wonderful discussion here. And sadly, we don't have much time left now. So here we have to call, call it in. Thank you very much for uh, wa watching us, all the participants. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Atulji. Thank, thank you for your moderation. Thank you, Atulji. Thank you. Thank you, Atulji, for the thank moderation. Yes, it was really nice. Thank you, Nehari. Thank you.